Hello, it's Eric again. Today I'll be discussing summary statements and semantic qualifiers. First, what are summary statements and why are they important? A summary statement is a concise summary of the most important key features of a presentation, including symptoms, signs, and tests, which helps the clinical reasoning process by prompting the clinician or student to identify what's most important and to properly frame the case before generating a working diagnosis, problem list, and plan. They also are an essential component of rapid communication during hospital rounds, handoffs, and consult calls. Let's look at a hypothetical case to demonstrate what a summary statement looks like. Suppose we have a 67-year-old man who presented to the ER reporting that he passed out yesterday. And after taking a detailed history, we identify the following key features. He's of older age, he passed out while walking. There was no prodrome before yesterday's episode. His wife, who was with him at the time, observed no seizure-like movements. He experienced no urinary or fecal incontinence that would suggest a seizure. He had no palpitations. On the other hand, he has experienced worsening occasional lightheadedness, fatigue, and dyspnea with exertion for one month prior to yesterday's episode. He has a past medical history of hypertension, coronary artery disease, and atrial fibrillation. He is a prior smoker, and he recently increased his metoprolol dose, a common medication to use for blood pressure control in patients with concurrent heart disease or atrial fibrillation. And let's suppose that key physical exam findings include a regular bradycardia, no orthostatic hypotension, and an otherwise unremarkable cardiac and pulmonary exam. Key test results include normal routine labs and an ECG with AFib, complete heart block, and a junctional escape rhythm. Well, that's a lot of information. How might we concisely summarize all that into no more than a few sentences? How about this? In summary, the patient is a 67-year-old man with a history of multiple cardiovascular risk factors, atrial fibrillation, and a recently increased dose of metoprolol, who presents with subacute progressive episodic lightheadedness, fatigue, and dyspnea, and an episode of exertional syncope without prodrome yesterday. Physical exam is notable only for a regular bradycardia, routine labs are normal, and his ECG shows AFib with complete heart block and a junctional escape rhythm. How did I do that? How did I convey the essence of an entire presentation with over 20 individual elements into just a few sentences? Part of the technique involves using semantic qualifiers. These are words which concisely describe the characteristics of a symptom or sign in a patient's presentation. They are used to compare and contrast competing diagnostic considerations and often take the form of paired opposites. Some examples. When describing the onset of a symptom, it can be described as acute versus chronic, or subacute if it falls somewhere in between. The temporal course can be described as continuous or constant versus episodic or intermittent. The site of a symptom or sign can be described as unilateral versus bilateral, symmetric versus asymmetric, proximal versus distal, diffuse versus localized or focal, monoarticular versus polyarticular for joint symptoms specifically. Symptoms and signs can be described as painful or painless. Triggers include postprandial, meaning after eating, versus exertional, versus pleuritic, meaning with deep inspiration, versus positional. The symptom of cough can be described as productive versus non-productive, depending on whether it's associated with phlegm. And emesis and diarrhea can be bloody versus non-bloody. How might we use these qualifiers to more concisely summarize symptoms? Imagine a patient who reports for the last 30 minutes my chest has hurt whenever I take a deep breath. That becomes acute pleuritic chest pain. Over the past several months, both legs have been getting weaker and weaker, becomes chronic progressive bilateral lower extremity weakness. And I've had a couple episodes of diarrhea over the past six months with blood mixed in the stool. There's a lot of stomach pain when it happens. This becomes chronic, episodic, painful bloody diarrhea. Why bother using semantic qualifiers? It's been shown in observational studies 
that expert clinicians have a tendency to use significantly more semantic qualifiers in their clinical reasoning and in the development of summary statements. It is believed that semantic qualifiers increase one's ability to accurately categorize a patient's illness, match the illness to known etiologies of the presenting problem, and thus generate an accurate and appropriately focused differential diagnosis. And the use of semantic qualifiers helps to convey information more quickly. While not the primary reason to use semantic qualifiers, as a trainee, using them will also make you sound significantly more professional to your seniors and attendings. I want to go through another example, but in this case, play a video of a patient encounter. I'll start with just the HPI for three or four minutes. And as you watch the video, take notes, try to identify the key features of the patient's history, and then think about what semantic qualifiers you might apply to her symptoms. Hi, good morning. Hi. Dr. Fang. Pleased to meet you. I'm Judy. Is it okay if I call you Judy? Oh, yeah, please, yeah. Wonderful. Um, Judy, tell me a little bit about what brings you in today. I, I'm having trouble breathing. Hmm. Okay. Mm. Um, tell me a little bit more about, about the breathing. Yeah, sure. So um, I, I started feeling it kind of mid-morning yesterday. When I woke up, I felt fine. But halfway through my morning at work, I was climbing the stairs to go to a meeting, and I started feeling like I was having a hard time catching my breath. Mm. So this came on very suddenly. Yeah. You weren't having really. shortness of breath a few days ago or even a week ago. No, it's fine. Was that the first time you've had problems breathing, or is this an ongoing issue? Well, it's, I've never had anything like this before. Oh, um, okay. Um, what makes it better or worse? Um, uh, not much makes it better except, like, not exerting myself, you know, okay. just resting. Um, that helps. Okay. Uh, do you notice difficulty breathing right now, even at, at just rest? Just a little bit, yeah. It's okay. not so bad, but, it ju but um, yeah, even sitting here mm -hmm. is bad. And you mentioned it's been really getting worse noticeably over the last day or Definitely so. Definitely getting worse, yeah. I woke up this morning, I can't even like walk to my car without wow. feeling, yeah. Okay. Are you pretty active at baseline? Mostly, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I do a spin class like three times oh, a week, okay. which is pretty intense, you yeah, know. And I'm yeah. usually fine with that, yeah. So there's a real change. Yeah, in the baseline. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, have you noticed any other symptoms along with the difficulty breathing? Yeah, I've got this pain in my chest oh, as well. Okay. Um, tell me more about that. Yeah, that came on um, sort of a couple of hours after I noticed the breathing problem, so right around lunchtime yesterday. Okay. Sort of sharp pain in my chest. So also very acutely, not something that you've had yeah, in the no, past. Yeah, no, I've never had that before. Okay. Um, and can you point to where the chest pain is? Yeah, it's sort of like more on the right side okay. of my chest. Does it go anywhere to your arm, across your chest, to your jaw, anything like no, that? No, no, it's just there, just like in my chest there. Okay. Do you feel it all the time or only uh, intermittently? Um, well, now I'm feeling it all the time. Okay. Yeah. But before it before was more it was more like intermittent. Intermittent. Okay. S seems mm -hmm. like it, it's getting a little worse also yes, over time. Yes, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's identify semantic qualifiers appropriate for the symptoms in this HPI. The dyspnea is acute, constant, and progressive. And the chest pain is acute, now constant, progressive, unilateral, and non-radiating. You may have considered two additional semantic qualifiers that I have not listed. First, her dyspnea sounded exertional. Why not include that too? Remember that one of the purposes of using semantic qualifiers is to help compare and contrast competing diagnostic considerations. Almost all dyspnea, irrespective of etiology, is worse with exertion. So it's not diagnostically helpful. That's different than exertional chest pain, exertional syncope, or exertional palpitations. For those symptoms, the exertional component is very diagnostically helpful. The other qualifier you may have thought about was the patient's use of the word sharp to describe the chest pain. Unfortunately, in my experience, this specific adjective is also not diagnostically helpful because different people mean different things when they describe a pain as sharp. Some people mean that it's very severe, some people mean that it's very well localized, and others mean that it comes on extremely quickly, like being stabbed. While each of those characteristics is helpful, unless you know which the patient means, 
the word sharp alone is too nonspecific to be useful as a qualifier. Now let's watch the rest of the encounter and then practice summarizing the whole thing. Um, have you noticed any other symptoms? Uh, any fevers, mm. chills, no nausea? Fevers. No. Anyone around you been sick? Don't think so, no. 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 Uh, Judy, what other medical problems do you have? I do have asthma. Um, I've had that since I was a teenager, but okay. it's not like this. You know. Yeah. How bad is your asthma? Have you ever been hospitalized, or do you take medications every day for it? No, no, um, I've never been hospitalized, and I do have this albuterol inhaler, mm. um, but I really only use that sort of during the winter when it's cold, and I use that like maybe a couple times a month. You okay. Know? You haven't needed it or used it during this episode? Of well, I did try it, you know, to okay. begin with. I did try it, and it, I didn't, I can't say that it really made Didn't a big really difference. Help. Not really, no. Okay. Okay. Um, any other medical issues? High blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, anything no, like that? Heart disease, nothing yeah. like that. Mm. Other than the albuterol inhaler, do you take any medications uh, on a daily basis? Um, I take a oral contraceptive. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. you've been on that for a long time, or only yeah, about ten years now. Wow. Yeah. Um, anything herbal or over the counter? Um, I take like ibuprofen if I get cramps occasionally, okay. Okay. and I take um, fish oil uh, okay. every day. Okay. Yeah. Have you needed any um, ibuprofen for the last couple of days because of the pain and the shortness of breath? No, I haven't tried that. Tried no. It. Okay. Okay. Uh, Judy, any chronic medical illnesses that run in your family that you're aware of? Well, my mom did have lung cancer. Oh. Wow. Yeah. That was pretty scary. So she had that in her early 50s. Okay. And um, she got um, treated with chemotherapy. Okay. And uh, that's, that seems to work because she's in remission now. Oh, good, so. good. I'm glad to hear mm -hmm. that. Um, nothing else really in the family, though, other than that No, episode. my dad's really healthy, healthy and nothing else. Any siblings or anything? No siblings. No siblings. No. Okay. Only child. Okay. Uh, do you smoke? I do, yes. How much do I you do. smoke? Not a ton. Um, I'll have a cigarette or two, you know, every other day, every something other like day. that. Yeah, okay. I don't smoke every day. Okay. And how about alcohol? Um, you drink every day. I do. I do okay. drink every day. I have a I have a, a shot of whiskey, a scotch before bed. Okay. Night. But just so one. You're not someone who drinks a, a lot. No, of I don't put time. away a ton. No, it's okay. just a little part of our nighttime ritual. Okay. Like a scotch and bitters before bed. Okay. Uh, and any illicits? Cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, oh, no, none no, of those no. things. Okay. Um, have you traveled recently? I just came back from London, actually. Oh, yeah. What were yeah, you in London I was for? at a tech conference there. So okay, as part of work. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, and uh, how was it? It was great. Yeah. It was a it was a, a jam packed like four days of meetings and meeting people and going to seminars and stuff. Wow. It was really great. It was Sounds great. busy. It was very busy. Um, Judy, what do you think is going on? Well, I'm kind of worried that it might be some kind of lung cancer thing. Mm -hmm. I just lost my best friend last month to lung cancer. And, Sorry you know, to hear that. Yeah. she didn't smoke a great deal more than I did. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, it's on my mind. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that um, must be worrisome with that yeah. and then what you told me about, about, your, my mom, like, yeah. about your mom. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad that you're here. Thank I you. Think, um, it's very appropriate. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm. Uh, we're going to figure out what's going on. Thank you. Uh, if it's okay with you, I'd like to do a quick physical exam. Yes. And get some lab work and think about some imaging to figure out what's going on. Sure. And uh, we'll go from there. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. I'd love to. Any questions for me? No, not at this point. Okay. I won't show a physical exam in the interest of time, but we will summarize it here. Feel free to pause the video and look through the whole thing. But I'll highlight the mild tachycardia, the mild hypoxemia, and the unremarkable pulmonary, cardiac, and extremity exams. Here are the patient's CBC and basic metabolic panel. They are totally normal. And her chest x-ray, which I'll tell you is also totally normal. So now we have a history, exam, and some diagnostic tests. How would we summarize Judy's case? There are many different ways to construct a summary statement, but I think the following works best for 99% of patients 
who are either inpatients or presenting to an ER or urgent care clinic. Consider four components, age and gender, highly relevant past medical and social history, a summary of the primary symptom or symptoms using semantic qualifiers, and a summary of objective findings with interpretation and grouping into clinical syndromes when relevant. In short, the first half of the statement answers who is this patient, and the second half answers what is their disease. Let's apply this structure to Judy's case. In summary, Ms. Smith is a 45-year-old woman with a history of asthma, current smoking, and a recent transatlantic flight who presents with acute onset of both progressive constant dyspnea and progressive unilateral right side at chest pain. Objective data is notable for a regular tachycardia, mild hypoxemia, normal cardiac, pulmonary, and extremity exams, and a normal chest x-ray. If we return to the first patient with the exertional syncope, we'll see that the same structure was followed. In summary, the patient is a 67-year-old man with a history of multiple cardiovascular risk factors, atrial fibrillation, and a recently increased dose of metoprolol, who presents with subacute progressive episodic lightheadedness, fatigue, and mild dyspnea, followed by an episode of exertional syncope without prodrome yesterday. Physical exam is notable only for irregular bradycardia, routine labs are normal, and his ECG shows AFib with complete heart block and a junctional escape rhythm. A question that frequently comes up regarding summary statements is whether it should include a diagnosis. There's a spectrum of opinions about this, but my recommendation is to include a suspected diagnosis within the summary statement itself only if the available data overwhelmingly supported over alternatives. Otherwise, the leading diagnosis should be subsequently introduced within a broader discussion about the entire differential diagnosis. That differential diagnosis discussion can either immediately follow the summary statement in the notes or oral presentation, or be included within the relevant problem within the problem list, the subject of another video. Some examples of this. Imagine we have a 55-year-old woman with a heavy smoking history who presents with chronic progressive dyspnea and a productive cough, found to have hyperinflation on chest x-ray and an obstructive pattern on pulmonary function tests. That is overwhelmingly suggestive of COPD, and thus COPD would be appropriate to include in the summary statement. A 32-year-old man with HIV and last CD4 count of 50, who presents with subacute dyspnea and weight loss, found to have bilateral crackles on exam and multifocal bilateral opacifications on chest x-ray. In this case, while you may strongly suspect an infection, given the patient's substantial immunocompromise and nonspecific nature of the objective findings, this could be any one of a dozen or more lung infections. So no listing of a specific diagnosis in this case. A 70-year-old man with diabetes who presents with acute exertional chest pressure and dyspnea, elevated troponin, and ST elevations on ECG. This is essentially diagnostic of an ST elevation myocardial infarction. One more example. A 60-year-old man with cirrhosis and heavy alcohol use who presents with acute hematemesis found to be in hypovolemic shock and with a hemoglobin of 7 grams per deciliter. Maybe this seems most likely to be a consequence of ruptured esophageal varices, but could very easily be from severe gastritis, a peptic ulcer, or less typically a Mallory Weiss tear combined with coagulopathy. So again, I would not include a diagnosis here within the summary statement itself, but you absolutely will need to discuss diagnoses within a broader discussion of the full differential diagnosis. Throughout your training on the wards and in clinics, you will encounter many variations on the summary statement and many different opinions about it. They can vary in length from three to four words to five to six sentences. They can vary in content from using only semantic qualifiers to relisting most of the key features of the presentation, from never including a suspected diagnosis to always including one. Overall, I think the format I presented here does the best job at splitting the difference between the ends of these spectrums, providing a concise yet informative summary that aids in rapid communication and aids in the clinical reasoning process. One rule of thumb I like to use with summary statements is that if your listener or your reader were to miss the entire preceding presentation or note 
and they only heard your summary statement, they should still be able to deduce what your top diagnosis was. Not the entire differential, or not even how likely that top diagnosis was, but they should be able to guess it. So if all you heard about Ms. Smith was this, you should be able to predict that I, as the writer of this summary statement, is thinking that the most likely diagnosis is a pulmonary embolism. There is one final point to make about summary statements. Many people use different names to refer to the same or similar concept. So when you are out there in the world, you will hear summary statements usually referred to as either assessments or impressions, or particularly in the medical literature, as problem representations. Some clinicians will say that these terms are all synonymous, while others will say that they have small but significant distinctions. In my own practice, I use assessment as a synonym for summary statement, and impression more to imprecisely refer to a general discussion about a patient's differential diagnosis. But I would not assert that this is the only right way to approach these terms. There's just no consensus about it. So be aware of the variability in their usage and be prepared to temporarily shift your usage if working with someone who has a strong, differing opinion on their definitions. The key takeaway points for this video. Semantic qualifiers are descriptors, often taking the form of paired opposites, which characterize symptoms and signs of a patient's presentation. Semantic qualifiers summarize clinical information and help to compare and contrast competing diagnostic possibilities. Creating a summary statement is an important skill that helps both the clinical reasoning process and rapid communication between healthcare professionals. Summary statements are made more concise and thus more effective by the incorporation of semantic qualifiers. And finally, there is much variability in the name, length, scope, and content of summary statements.